America's most prestigious celebration of the arts. Over the past 37 years, the world's most exciting performers have paid tribute to 195 remarkable individuals, actors, dancers, musicians, composers, and playwrights, as they have been recognized for their lifelong achievements. Our national celebration of artistic excellence continues tonight. From the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C., we honor George Lucas, the innovator who pushed the boundaries of cinematic storytelling. Carol King, the singer-songwriter whose gift of music has spoken to generations. Cicely Tyson, the trailblazing actress who paved the way for women of color and stories of equality. Seiji Ozawa, the maestro from the East who found his calling in the music of the West. And Rita Moreno, the pioneering Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony winning performer. The Kennedy Center Honors. And now, please welcome your host, Stephen Colbert. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished honorees, elected representatives, diplomats, dignitaries, and the small handful of you not running for president right now. <laughs> welcome to the 38th annual Kennedy Center Honors. As I stand here, humbled by the beautiful John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, Surrounded by some of the most influential people in politics and culture, I am inspired to ask, can anyone get me tickets to Hamilton? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Seated with the First Lady tonight are our five honorees. They will remain in the balcony for the entire evening. They don't actually appear on stage at the Kennedy Center Honors. They don't have to do anything tonight but sit there and listen to the presentations. We can say nice things about them. We could say terrible things about them. The point is, you cannot leave. <laughs> the contributions of tonight's honorees are staggering. The filmmaker in seat 1138 brought us film classics like Star Wars and Indiana Jones, movie franchises that changed American culture forever, but totally ruined Harrison Ford's carpentry career, <laughs> Mr. George Lucas. Tonight, we also honor the Emmy and Tony award-winning actors who, at 90 years old, is still not only working, she had to take a night off from her Broadway play to join us, the great Cicely Tyson. Thank you for being here, and congratulations. We also honor the great maestro Seiji Ozawa. As a conductor, he is the only one tonight who did not have to change outfits on the way over from the office. Tonight, we honor an actress whose career has spanned more than six decades, Rita Moreno. She's had a legendary career, including the 1961 film adaptation of West Side Story, a movie that opened a generation's eyes to the dangers of ballet gang violence. <laughs> now. Now. Easy action. <laughs> and finally, the singer-songwriter whose music told us, you've got a friend, though I do want to point out she has never showed up to help me move, Carol King. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, join me in saluting our 2015 Kennedy Center honorees. Our first presenter is a Golden Globe winning actress and star of the CW's Jane the Virgin. It's about a woman who becomes pregnant without having sex. I know, it seems implausible. A TV show without sex? Come on. <laughs> Please welcome Gina Rodriguez. Dear Rita Moreno, you don't know me yet. I'm a 15-year-old aspiring actress named Gina Rodriguez. 
My dad always tells me to write down my goals and my dreams and then to work towards getting them. I want to be just like you. I want to make people laugh and cry. I want to fight for women's rights and I want to perform for the world. If you can tell me how to do that, please write me back at Puerto Rican Dulce 714 at AOL.com. <laughs> I never sent the letter, and little did I know there was another letter I would be blessed to write 15 years later. I wrote and rewrote this love letter to you over and over again, tossing and turning, trying to find the right words. But how do you tell your idol how much you love her after dreaming of the chance to do so? A 15-year-old girl from Chicago who hadn't seen a Puerto Rican represented on screen once asked her mother, Mom, when did Puerto Ricans come about? What do you mean, Gina? I never see us on my favorite TV shows or movies. We must not have existed back then, right? And then she introduced me to you. I met you on screen and I just loved you. Your bright smile, your fierce persona, that independent voice that bursts through every performance and every interview. And I just wanted to be just like Rita. You gave me hope. You gave me a reason to fight and to speak up. You gave me a voice. And how can I thank you? I'm not sure I know how, but I can tell you this. When you followed your dreams, Rita, you gave me the allowance to follow mine. And now, being your granddaughter on Jane, the most surreal blessing in my life. You are my icon, my living legend, and what matters most, my friend. Rita, this is my love letter to you. And now you know how much you affected that 15-year-old Puerto Rican girl from Chicago. I hope you enjoy. My friend, Rosa Dolores Alverio, was born in Umacao, Puerto Rico. At the age of five, she and her mother braved a harrowing boat trip to begin a new life in New York's Spanish Harlem. The tough streets introduced her to the racism that would spark her lifelong passion for equal rights. She was feisty, ambitious, and filled with a desire to perform. It was at a dance recital that a Hollywood agent took notice, introducing her to legendary producer Louis B. Mayer, who promptly dubbed Rosa the Spanish Elizabeth Taylor. By 19 years old, Rosa was a bona fide member of the studio system, landing small but steady roles that intensified her desire. At the urging of a casting agent who thought her name was too ethnic, she changed it to resemble that of a star whom she idolized, Rita Hayworth. But despite her attempts to assimilate, Rita was cast as what she called one ethnic spitfire after the other. Life can be bright in America. And then came what Rita would call the role of her life. Anita in West Side Story. She knew this character and understood all too well the battles she faced. I'd walk by and spit on you. Don't let it go. So tell Gina that Tony's hiding in the cellar. Don't you touch me. With this performance, Rita became the first Latina woman to win an Academy Award. I can't believe it! Good Lord! I leave you with that. More films would follow, including starring roles opposite Marlon Brando, Jack Nicholson, and Alan Arkin. Listen, it's not news to me that I'm Puerto Rican. I am proud of it. For her role in The Ritz, Rita channeled her mother and the Puerto Rican women from her childhood to create the hilarious Googie Gomez, both on Broadway and film. Everything's coming up, Rosa, for me, and for you, you, you. And it earned her a Tony for Best Featured Actress. I mean, Rita Moreno is thrilled, but... Rosa Dolores Alverio from Umacao, Puerto Rico is undone! In 1965, Rita married Leonard Gordon and gave birth to the love of their lives, Fernanda Luisa. When the new mom was introduced to Sesame Street, she fell in love with the Muppets and begged Jim Henson for a role. And boy, did she land it. When you put your arms around me, I get the fever that's so hard to bear. You give me fever. Hey, you guys! And when Electric Company came calling, well, she did it again. You got soup. We 
got soup. What kind of soup? All kinds of soup. We got beet soup, that's a sweet soup. Then there's meat soup, parakeet soup, shredded wheat soup, and concrete soup, and the special today, dirty beet soup. Truth be told, children's television wasn't her agent's favorite choice. Until, that is, Rita won a Grammy for The Electric Company and an Emmy for her appearance on The Muppets. <laughs> Who else has got an Oscar, a Tony, a Grammy, and an Emmy? Two Emmys. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't want to brag. <laughs> For Rita, every trophy and accolade carried with it an added value. It gave her a platform to fight for what mattered most. I consider my human role in life much more important than my life or my role as a performer. But Rita's greatest triumph would be her role as a trailblazer for the generations that followed. And that's how I feel, standing beside Rita as she plays my glamorous grandma on Jane the Virgin. No, I can't. I have to hug you first. <laughs> on stage, in film, and on television, Rita Moreno has inspired us, Liar! held us breathless, and made us laugh until we cried. The tribute to Rita Moreno continues when the Kennedy Center Honors returns. Only CBS. The ship carrying a young girl named Rosa Dolores, steamed by the Statue of Liberty. Oh my goodness, she thought, a lady runs this country. <laughs> Welcome back to the Kennedy Center Honors. Now, ladies and gentlemen, with a special performance, here are Rosie Perez and Animal. Never know how much I love ya. Never know how much I care. When you put your arms around me, I get a fever that's so hard to bear. You give me a fever. When you kiss me, fever when you hold me tight. A fever in the morning, fever all through the night. Oye, buddy, nada más. Quiero decirte que no debes hacer eso. It's not nice. Entiendes? Mírame cuando te hable. Este es mi número. Y si tú me fastidias más, te voy a dar una canata que te va a dejar bobo. So cool it. Yeah, cool it. Sunlight's up the morning. Moonlight's up the night. I light up when you call my name. Cause you know I'm gonna treat you right to give my fever When you kiss me When she won the Emmy for that performance with the Muppets, she was a wonderfully sexy and funny woman being wonderfully sexy and funny. In other words, she was herself. And we thank you. So from one Borinqua to another, te amo mucho, Rita. Te amo mucho. Because without you, there would be no me. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, Emmy, Grammy, and Tony winner, Lynn manuel Miranda. There's an old Puerto Rican phrase, a boricuazo, if you will, that describes Rita Moreno perfectly. A calzón quitado. 
Literally, it means you have no pants on. <laughs> but we use it to describe someone who is brutally honest and fearless. What you see is what you get. That's our Rita. I'll give you an example. Last year, Rita was my date for a Latino fundraiser in New York. Pretty cool date. The musical guest was Esperanza Azteca, a youth orchestra from Puebla, Mexico, made up of extraordinary children from impoverished backgrounds who were recruited to play classical instruments. This was their New York debut. This incredible music was being drowned out by the sound of people talking, networking. We're in DC, are you familiar with this experience? <laughs> so Rita and I are staring at the spectacle side by side and I turn to her saying, this is so unfair. No one is listening to these kids. Rita, Rita? The chair next to me is empty. I look back up and Rita has stormed the stage like an altruistic Kanye West. <laughs> Screaming, stop the music, stop the music. The audience sees Rita Moreno, living legend, EGOT, and starts screaming and cheering and she harnesses their energy and brings them to silence in one swift Jedi move, Mr. Lucas. <laughs> and she says, ladies and gentlemen, these children are a gift our future and our legacy, they made miracles happen for the chance to perform for you tonight. They deserve your silence and they deserve your attention. And that's what Rita Moreno has been doing for our people her whole career. She made miracles happen for the chance to perform for us. And now, with a special tribute honoring Rita's unforgettable performance in the movie West Side Story, please welcome my friends, Tony winner Karen Olivo as Anita and George Akram as Bernardo, America. I go back to San Juan. I know we both you can get on. Uh, everyone there will give big cheer. Hey! Everyone there will have moved here.
The Kennedy Center Honors returns with a tribute to George Lucas. George Lucas recently shared one of his regrets. He told a reporter, I never got the experience that everyone else got to have. I never got to see Star Wars. <laughs> well, George, let me tell you, you missed out. It was really good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Carrie Fisher. Oh my goodness, where could she be? Play the message? What message? Well then, of course, you should play it, you dimwit. How dare you use such language? Just play it, and then we can get out of here. Hi, George. It's me. Look, I wanted to be there to help celebrate your Kennedy Center honor in person, but hey, since you invented video voicemail, I don't have to be. <laughs> um, I do want to tell you how much I admire your talent. You may not have been my only hope, but fans around the world, thank you for giving us a new hope. And now, in the honoree box, please welcome Melody Hobson. He just said, oh no. Right now, my husband is thinking, Melody, what are you doing? Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm honoring you, just like everyone here tonight. I think George's movies have stayed and grown in our hearts for the last 40 years, because the stories are so simple, and yet at the same time, so profound. George's movies have soul. He'll be the first to tell you that Star Wars is not a movie about spaceships. It's about family. And family is something that George understands and deeply cherishes. One of the most memorable lines in Star Wars that George wrote is when Princess Leia says to Han Solo, I love you. And he responds, I know. <laughs> well, George, in case you didn't know, we love you, especially me. So now I will direct your attention to the screen where James Earl Jones will explain how George's path led from Modesto, California to this chair. Extreme close up! Whoa. George Lucas once said, deeply ingrained in our reality is our relationship with our parents and kids. That's where the real stories always end up. His story began in an idyllic American way. Born in Modesto, California, George was free to unleash his busy imagination. He immersed himself in comic books, shared adventures with Flash Gordon, and watched radio serials in his mind's eye. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> I love to build things. I loved working on cars and engines. And all I wanted to do was race cars. Just days before high school graduation, George was broadsided by a classmate traveling 90 miles an hour. He was found unconscious with no trace of a pulse. The long period of convalescence had a life-changing effect on George. He decided to trade race cars for college. George's first student film was an avant-garde sensation. He won first prize at 47 film festivals. And in 1971, with Francis Ford Coppola producing, George directed his first feature film. THX 1138 was a disquieting look at the future, set in the 25th century. It was our first glimpse of George's desire to reject the status quo. My first impression was, I hate you. <laughs> I hate that guy, man. He's so much better than I am. George followed up his exploration of the future 
with a trip to the past. American graffiti. His past. Where were you in 62? He inhabited every character in the film and defied studio brass by intercutting four seemingly unrelated stories, making them work as one, and using popular music instead of a traditional score. American Graffiti was a massive success, propelling George and Lucasfilm into the stratosphere. What if you came up higher? It was just his third feature film, and it changed everything. I know this is gonna work. I know it's gonna work because it's impossible. The way movies are made, the way we watch them, and the way they make us feel. To the world famous Chinese theater come the stars of the biggest box office success in motion picture history. No film before or since has had a greater cultural influence. Oh, put that down. Cigarettes are dangerous. <laughs> it transcended the zeitgeist and became part of the American experience. Well, I'd say cut. With Star Wars behind him, George bucked the system again. Hi, Daddy. Daddy? I think the biggest thing on Earth. He retired from directing for 15 years to raise his children. That's Daddy putting on a Snoopy ornament. Good morning, Katie. Hey, Dad. As his children grew, so did his empire. And his ability to give back. Pledging half of his fortune to charity, he is one of the most prolific philanthropists in the world, having created the George Lucas Educational Foundation at Utopia and the upcoming Lucas Museum of Narrative Art. George once said, don't listen to your peers, don't listen to your parents, don't listen to your culture, only listen to yourself. That's where you're going to find your truth. And now, please welcome 2006 Kennedy Center honoree, Steven Spielberg. George Lucas, he's a pathfinder and a pioneer, like Edison and Bell and Tesla and Jobs, in the way that everything they touched changed a paradigm. George Lucas's Star Wars changed movies absolutely forever. And in my knowing George Lucas all these exciting years, I've experienced the power of the force, but never the dark side. I've seen George's moral urge in living his life as a good husband, a good dad, and a generous philanthropist. And at 71 years old, George still has all of his hair, <laughs> just as Chewbacca still has all of his. He must run the family. When, when George first envisioned Star Wars, the technology to make it didn't exist, so George had to invent it. His determination helped invent a new generation of special effects and launched a legendary company, ILM Industrial Light and Magic. And for 40 years and more than 300 films, including seven of the top 10 worldwide box office hits of all time, the artists at ILM have been doing the impossible. Lucasfilm and all its divisions have garnered an unprecedented 43 Academy Awards. And of course, who can forget that George also <laughs> ushered in the next generation of surround sound called THX. So George, the audience is listening, and thanks to you, we promise we will never stop. For George Lucas, the only limit to what is possible is one's imagination. In 1975, he created Industrial Light and Magic to realize his vision for Star Wars. And with every success, George reinvested in the future, not just his, but every filmmaker's. It's wonderful to know that the tools are there 
to really begin to get what's in here, you know, out there into the, into the world. And ILM has been leading the charge in that quest since it began. Every CG effect we see today was born of the genius of George and his team, who together pioneered one first after another. The first fully computer-generated character. The first 3D character. First recreation of human skin. He has elevated the art of storytelling to affect not just what we see, but the way we see and hear it. Somewhere along his mythical journey, George Lucas got a look at the future, and he's been showing it to us ever since. Our tribute to George Lucas continues with a thrilling performance next on the Kennedy Center Honors. And now, please welcome 2007 Kennedy Center honoree, Martin Scorsese. Well, as you've just seen, my old friend, George Lucas, um, and it is an old friendship. I mean, it goes back over 40 years. George has many areas of deep interest, fascination, and really obsession. And of course, the first obsession, cars. The man loves his cars. And the second obsession, movies about cars. <laughs> George has always, always tried to stay ahead of the technological curve. But all of that technology, all of that, you know, uh, invention, all of that uh, hardware, software stuff, has all been at the service of storytelling. That's George's magnificent obsession, to pay homage to a picture we grew up with. He's a born storyteller. And George was also there at the beginning of the Film Foundation, which is an organization I started 25 years ago with some friends, uh, which is dedicated to the protection and preserving of our motion picture heritage. And at this point, I think we've helped to restore nearly 700 films. And many of these restorations were made possible by George and his generous and continuing support. And George also has another great passion that uh, I want to tell you about, music. He's an artist who thinks musically. The music and the images are inseparable. In fact, the music in his pictures actually becomes another character.
Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. The Jedi turned against me. Don't you turn against me. Anakin, you're breaking my heart. Special performance by Miranda Lambert is next on the Kennedy Center Honors. Only CBS. Welcome back to the Kennedy Center Honors. Once again, your host, Stephen Colbert. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, before we go on, I have a quick announcement. Uh, the owner of a green and white helicopter, um, <laughs> license plate M-A-R-I-N-E-1, um, you left your lights on, <laughs> and uh, also you parked it on the roof. If I'm not mistaken, that's a tow zone. Thank you for joining us, Mr. President. <laughs> it's been an amazing night of honoring the honorees, but now it's time to honor the honorers. Please welcome the chairman of the Kennedy Center, David Rubenstein. As we celebrate our distinguished honorees tonight, we are reminded of the overwhelming power of the performing arts and the impact the arts have on students, educators, families, and communities. The John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts fulfills President Kennedy's legacy every day through commissions, performances, and arts education initiatives. It is one of the world's most prestigious and respected performing arts centers, and we are committed to maintaining and enhancing this living memorial for future generations. Thank you, and on with the show. In addition to tonight's honorees, the Kennedy Center intended to celebrate the career of legendary rock band The Eagles. But due to Glenn Fry's health complications, his bandmates have chosen to postpone their honor until next year, where they can accept the honor the way they made their music, together and shirtless. But, <laughs> it's the 70s. But since the rest of us are here, let's celebrate them anyway. Performing Desperado is two-time Grammy and 23-time Academy of Country Music Award winner, Miranda Lambert. Seems to me some fine things have been laid 
But you only want the one you can't get. Desperado, mm, you ain't getting no younger. Your pain and your hunger driving you home. Your freedom, oh freedom, well that's just some people talking. The Kennedy Center Honors returns with a tribute to Cicely Tyson, featuring Tyler Perry and a performance by CeCe Winans. The oldest of the 2015 Kennedy Center Honorees was born over 90 years ago. You won't be able to tell. <laughs> Please welcome actor, writer, director, Tyler Perry. Thank you, that's awfully kind. About uh, three years ago, I had an opportunity to do a movie called Alex Cross, where I played Alex, and Cicely Tyson played my mother. Nana Mama was the character's name. And I remember this moment in particular because I had so much anxiety about it. As I was reading the script, there's this moment where Alex is angry, and he's running toward the front door, full speed ahead, and Nana Mama has to run behind him, stop him, and spin him around. So I go to the director, and I'm looking at this, and how are we supposed to do this? I mean. Me and Cecily, I mean, I'm six foot six, and she's five foot nothing. I mean, I'm, I'm young, I'm 43 years old, she's <coughs> years old, what am I supposed to? Anyway, the day comes to do the scene, I talk to the director, he says, just go for it, just do it. I'm going, just do it, this is not a Nike ad, this is Cecily Tyson. I, I'm like, I can see the headlines now, Tyler Perry kills Cecily Tyson in a freak accident. So the day comes to shoot the scene, and I go, okay, fine, I'm just gonna do it. Here's what I'm doing. I'm in the head, I'm going, okay, I'm gonna count to 10 steps. And when I get to the 10th step, I'll slow down, and I'll feel these nice little grandma hands around my waist, and then I'll throw myself around like a WWE wrestler as if she did it. That's what I'll do. So he goes, action. And I go, I start walking. I'm gonna make it to 10. I get to the fourth step, and I feel the grip of death around <laughs> around my waist, fingernails digging in. <laughs> Cicely grabbed me and spun me around so much that I almost lost my balance. She spun me around like I was one of those little white girls on Dancing with the Stars. I mean, <laughs> I almost fell. I'm like, this woman is so strong. But of course she's strong. She's as strong as a woman called Moses. Cicely Tyson chose to empower us when we didn't even know it was possible for us to be empowered. For six decades, she has been diligent in her pursuit to better us all. Her journey hasn't been easy, but her talent, her integrity, 
her class, her grace, and her strength have brought her from the streets of Harlem all the way to that balcony here at the Kennedy Center Honors. Of course you are strong. Now to celebrate a little more of her strength, take a look at what we put together for Miss Cecily Tyson. Let me tell you about my friend Cecily Tyson. She was born in Harlem, New York, of immigrant parents from the West Indies. The children in her family were not allowed to see movies or plays, but as a little girl, Cecily loved to dance and perform. At the age of 18, while she was at a hair fashion show, she was discovered by an ebony magazine photographer. Cecily started modeling and went all the way to the top of the industry. Besides having a successful modeling career, there was a lot more waiting for Cicely, so she began acting. We'll have all the kids we want. We'll have so blooming many kids, you won't be able to find a place to walk in the house. Now, Cicely's mother was a very religious woman, and she thought that modeling and acting and all of those things would lead her right to the den of iniquity. Fearing that Cicely was on the wrong path, she kicked her out of the house and stopped talking to her. Ain't got no own. The silence lasted for three years, and it was only broken after her mother came to one of her live theatrical performances. As a series regular in the short-lived TV series, East Side, West Side, Cicely got her first taste of controversy. Her short hair made many people say that she was disgracing black women by wearing her hair in its natural state. What's the matter, Father? Am I embarrassing you in front of your friend? Despite this uproar, Cicely continued to wear her hair short, promoting the beauty and uniqueness of being a black woman. Nathan! In 1972, the film Sounder earned Cicely an Academy Award nomination. And who can forget her amazing performance as Benta in the television miniseries Roots? <laughs> Cicely refused to take a role that would not better humanity. Have courage for the great sorrows of life and patience for the small ones. Cicely once said to me, I only take a role if I read the script and my skin tingles. Well, our skin was tingling when we watched her play Miss Jane Pittman, the former slave who lived to be 110 years old and long enough to see the civil rights movement. The scene of her walking up to that white only water fountain and taking a sip is etched in our minds forever. For this unforgettable portrayal of Miss Jane Pittman, Cicely became the first African-American actress in a leading role to win an Emmy Award. Mom, it wasn't a den of iniquity after all. <laughs> Not just a model or an actress or an activist, Cicely's also known for her work with arts education. From being a founding board member of the Dance Theater of Harlem to today, working with children at the Cicely Tyson School of Performing and Fine Arts, a school which serves one of New Jersey's most underprivileged African-American communities. That's the stock that we are made of. What happened to us? Do you know who you are? Well, this is about the best barbecue I ever ate. Her talent has stood the test of time. Secrets in the sauce. When somebody hurts you, they take power. You don't forgive them, they keeps the power. With beauty, dignity, and grace, Cicely Tyson is undoubtedly a master of her art. In 2013, after a 30-year absence, she returned to Broadway in the acclaimed play, The Trip to Bountiful. Did you talk to Jessie Mae? Yes. Isn't she a sight? <laughs> For her performance Don't as Mrs. Don't Carrie Don't Watts, Don't she won the Tony Award. I'm the sole surviving member of my immediate family. And I've asked over and over again, why? I now know why. My friend Cicely always follows her instincts, or what she refers to as divine guidance. Cicely has always felt that life is about taking chances. She knows that life is about finding your own path. And Cicely has blazed the path of gold for many, many to follow. And now, please welcome Emmy and Tony winner, Viola Davis. When talking about achievements, 
my friend, my inspiration, my TV mother, Ms. Cicely Tyson once said that she prefers to believe that there is a mountain so high that she will spend the rest of her life striving to reach the top of it. It's that kind of spirit, that kind of determination and dedication that motivates others to follow her lead and our dreams. When I was a child, my sisters and I watched Miss Tyson in the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman to see her portrayal and her humanity actualized on screen. It changed my life. To see someone that resembled me achieving great things, who was climbing to that mountaintop, Miss Tyson gave me permission to dream, to believe I could climb that mountain too. And then Roots came along, which offered an impactful and unique perspective of history and race relations in America. As audience came to see Cicely's performance as Binta, mother of Kunta Kinte, it wasn't only a depiction of the African-American experience. It was the American experience. And now, on how to get away with murder. She continues to connect with viewers with her raw, riveting, and deep emotional life. And now, back on Broadway, with James Earl Jones and the Gin Game, this force of nature uses her immense talent to grab audiences by the heartstrings and show them the fears and hopes of growing old. Miss Tyson, Madam, thank you. Thank you for helping us, for helping me, see the mountain and inviting us on your incredible journey. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Carrie Washington. Ms. Cicely Tyson does not merely act. She delves, she soars, she sings, she vibrates, she is music. Two years ago when Ms. Tyson starred on Broadway in the play The Trip to Bountiful, something amazing happened at every performance. Soon after the curtain rose for the start of the second act, Ms. Tyson would sing the hymn, Blessed Assurance. All the day long. were so moved, so overwhelmed, we joined in. The song itself has personal meaning for Ms. Tyson. In the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, there is a pew, and on that pew is a plaque which she dedicated to Mother Blessed Assurance. The power of music is also a passion for Ms. Tyson. It's one she shared with her one-time husband, legendary trumpeter Miles Davis. Even though they went their separate ways and Miles has passed on, Ms. Tyson continues to commemorate his birthday with a very special tradition. Every year, she goes to a jazz club where she no doubt hears the rendition of the standard that Miles made his own my funny valentine now to celebrate your kennedy center honor please welcome cc winans terence blanchard and the sicily tyson community school of performing and fine arts choir performing blessed assurance Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, virtue.
Yo-Yo Ma performs a tribute to maestro Seiji Ozawa when we return with the Kennedy Center Honors. As a teenager in Tokyo, an aspiring classical pianist named Seiji Ozawa defied his mother's orders and joined a rugby match. Now I have to say, looking at you, Seiji, uh, I'm not sure that was a good idea. <laughs> Welcome back to the Kennedy Center Honors. No matter what their field, all the artists we honor tonight share one essential quality, fearlessness. And I'm reminded of President Kennedy who said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Of course, he was quoting Roosevelt at the time, but still, it's a pretty good quote. <laughs> Joining us now, please welcome 2003 Kennedy Center honoree, Itzhak Perlman. Hello, Seiji. We have known each other for close to 50 years. A lot of notes. Making music beginning in Toronto, where you were music director, in San Francisco, where you were music director, and almost 30 years with the Boston Symphony, a legacy to be sure, as well as other great orchestras around the globe. Seiji Ozawa is a great conductor and a great musician. What makes a great conductor? It's complicated and somewhat of a mystery. The ability to move the audience to an altered sphere of consciousness is what great art is about. Believe me that there is nothing better than making music with a colleague who is also a friend. Seiji, thanks for all your artistry and all your wonderful music making. We are all so grateful for your great contribution. And now to present the maestro's story is his dear friend, 2004 Kennedy Center honoree, John Williams. He's been described as calligraphy in motion. A liquid current of energy that rarefied soul feels music through his entire being. And it's this ethereal gift and his abiding love of life that would make his the unlikeliest of journeys. And now to meet our first challenger. Will you enter and sign in, please? Seiji Ozawa, is that right? So, who is my friend Seiji Ozawa? This genius who memorizes every score. And how, with his back to the audience, does he connect with us? Move us. Change us. Born to Japanese parents in China, Seiji's family moved back to Japan in the final tragic months of World War II. There, his Christian mother took him to church on Sundays, where he learned and loved its Western hymns. Still a boy and longing to learn the piano, his father loaded a 350-pound upright on a wheelbarrow and pushed it 50 miles to their home. But at 14, his virtuosic dreams were broken along with two fingers in a rugby game. A life without music would be no life at all. Seiji found his calling under the tutelage of the great Hideo Saito. 
the pioneering Japanese conductor of Western music. And this calling soon became his life. In just nine years' time, he was invited to conduct at Tanglewood. And in 1973, he found the place he'd call his American home for an astonishing 29 years, the Boston Symphony Orchestra. To me, Boston is always the most musical city of North America. During his tenure, Seiji helped mold the BSO into one of the most finely tuned music ensembles in the world. There, he chose to honor his teachers by mentoring students of his own. You're doing everything here. So, yeah. Could you open some, something? Seiji led with his joie de vivre, and for those who followed, there was magic at every turn. Especially in Boston, he loved the city's music, its people, and its favorite pastime. He even played for me with the Boston Pops. I had the rare privilege of hearing Seiji conduct my score from E.T. And I'd conducted this music probably over 500 times, and yet at that moment, it felt different. He seemed to find textures lying deeply within it, adding his own voice to the music. For me, it was as refreshing as it was revealing. It always struck me that this gifted man continues to attribute his accomplishments to luck. Well, to you, Seiji, and your beautiful family, to those who watched you, heard you, played for you, played with you, we are the lucky ones. Please welcome National Medal of Arts winner, Renee Fleming. It takes the rarest combination of qualities to make a great conductor. Maestro Seiji Ozawa's devotion to the score and his ability to divine what the composer intended are at the heart of his success in bringing classical music alive for new audiences. I first met Seiji at the Tanglewood Music Festival in 1991 when I stepped into Mozart's Idomeneo on short notice. It was very early in my career and I was joining a starry cast of name singers with the prestigious Boston Symphony Orchestra. There was no time for an audition. The maestro took me on a recommendation and faith. Fast forward 16 years and he conducted me in the world premiere of Le Temps L'Horloge by Henri Dutilleux in Paris. And together we won a Grammy. And now performing Tchaikovsky's Andante Cantabile in tribute to Maestro Ozawa, please welcome 2011 Kennedy Center honoree Yo-Yo Ma with the fellows of the Tanglewood Music Center.
Janelle Monet, James Taylor, Sarah Bareilles, and Aretha Franklin perform for Carol King on the Kennedy Center Honors. By the time she was 30, she teamed up with Jerry Goffin to write hits like You Make Me Feel Like a Natural Woman. I think I just became the first president ever to say that. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Secretary of State John Kerry. Whether you danced to her music in the 60s or were first enthralled by the gorgeous poetry and the incomparable voice of the 70s and later, whether you know her from a distance or, as Teresa and I have been privileged to be as a neighbor and a cherished friend, Carol King has a unique place in all of our hearts. Believe it or not, Carol King was 17 when she wrote her first number one song. And she and her partner, Jerry Goffin, who you've heard referred to earlier, churned out so many gold hits that another pair of songwriters admitted that all they ever wanted was to be like Goffin and King. And that is pretty high praise coming from a couple of guys from Liverpool named John Lennon and Paul McCartney. <laughs> so now, my friends, let's take a journey. Let's turn back the clock to 1971, head up the turnpike to Carnegie Hall, and watch this absolutely magnificent artist in one of her many legendary performances. Please welcome the Broadway cast of Beautiful, the Carol King Musical. So far away Doesn't anybody stay in one place anymore It would be so fine to see your face at my door This is probably a sure way to get applause in New York, but I was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> And being here at Carnegie Hall is a dream come true, not only for me, but for my mother. The dream of my mother's life was for me to play Carnegie Hall. Of course, she hoped that I'd play Mozart's piano sonata number three in B-flat major instead of Smackwater Jack. <laughs> but I like, I like all music, and I always have. I started playing piano as soon as I could reach the keys. That is my mom. She taught me to play. She never had to make me practice. I loved it so much. And after a while, I started making up my own songs. At 16, 
I convinced my mom and dad to let me go to New York City to audition for any music producer that would listen. At my second stop, I sold my first song. But my career didn't exactly take off. People thought I needed help with my lyrics. at the time, and just my luck, I met a guy there who wrote lyrics. This guy, Jerry Goffin. He was the handsomest boy there, maybe anywhere. <laughs> oh, I remember everything about the first time we met. I was wearing this dress, and he told me he needed a song for a play he'd written. Well, when I told him that I wrote music, he showed me his lyrics. What do you think? My God, they're incredible. Yes, I'd love to write a song with you. Great. <laughs> wow, you have a beautiful smile. I do? Um, I, I can't see it from in here. <laughs> you know, we could do more than write together. Have I told you the title of my play? No, what? The Young Lovers. You know, as a writer, I feel research is the best way to understand my characters, <laughs> so... Getting to know you in a more intimate way would really help us. Um, uh, we, we, we probably shouldn't. I always hear people shouldn't mix the personal and the professional. Who knew I love research? <laughs> Pretty soon we had a song. And then a bunch of songs. <laughs> and we had the most wonderful people singing them. People like Tony Orlando, the Drifters, the Chiffons, and the Shirelles. Ladies and gentlemen, Janelle Monet. happened pretty fast after that. We got married and I got pregnant. Well, actually, I got pregnant and then we got married, but, but we told it to my dad the other way. <laughs> Louise came first and then Sherry. We got a place in New Jersey on a street called Pleasant Valley Way. And because we were working so much, we hired a babysitter to help with the kids. And turned out, she helped with the music too. Her name was Little Eva. We commuted 
every day to 1650 Broadway, where we did our writing. This was the home of Alden Music, which was Donnie Kirshner's company. Donnie placed our songs with the right groups and always pushed us to keep turning out great stuff fast. <laughs> I mean it, I mean it. These are great lyrics. How did you even think of this? When I was growing up, our apartment was not a happy place to be. My dad wasn't getting what he wanted out of life, and he often had these moods. I didn't know how to deal with them, so I used to do this. And as soon as I got up there, it all got better. Ladies and gentlemen, James Taylor. When it's over, start to get in me down. And people are just too much for me to face. I want to climb way up to the top of the stairs and all my cares it just drift right in space oh on the roof it's peaceful as can be and sweet for you I'll get far away from the hustle and the crowd and all that rat race door I've been screaming Oh, on the roof That's the only place that I know don't be the city thing Where you just have to wish To make it so Let's go up on my roof Up on my roof What a time we had recording Tapestry. <laughs> Joni Mitchell was recording next door, and she and James came and sang back up on Will You Love Me. My girls would interrupt from home, call and ask if they really had to do their homework. We even used our cat, Telemachus, on the cover. I think that feeling of friends and family really seeped into the album. The winner is Carol King. You've got a flag. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Bareilles. When you're down and true.
Eventually, Jerry and I broke up, though I am glad to say we stayed friends. And I had to leave Donnie because I moved to L.A. But before I left New York, Jerry and I were walking down Broadway when Jerry Wexler, the co-founder of Atlantic Records, pulled up in his limo and said he had a song he wanted us to write. It turned out to be the last big hit Jerry and I did together, but what a way to end it, especially since the woman who sang it was one of the great American artists of all time. I would later do a version of it myself on Tapestry, but it was different from hers because, well, there is only one Aretha Franklin. <laughs>
more with Stephen Colbert, plus the finale of the Kennedy Center Honors. Thank you once again to the Broadway cast of Beautiful, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we've reached the end of tonight's ceremony. It's a fantastic night of performances and tributes to our incredible honorees. Thank you to all the performers. Thank you to the Kennedy Center for hosting such a special event. And how about a round of applause for our wonderful host, Stephen Colbert. Oh, my God. That is so not necessary. And again, we thank our honorees. Your work, your talent, your drive, and your pursuit of artistic excellence is a gift to the world that we cherish for generations. And as we say goodnight, let's celebrate with the music of Carol King. Trouble.